Elder Benetham asked me to introduce our speaker today. First, I want to apologize that Pastor Mello is not here to introduce you. <laughs> he and his family departed, as you probably remember, from camp meeting to go to be missionaries in New Zealand. Um, before he left, I worked with Pastor Mello to line up um, some guest speakers. Um, Mr. Brooks is one of them. He heads the Disabilities Ministries at the Georgia Cumberland Conference. If you visit their website for the conference and you go to the Disabilities Ministries, you'll see Dr. Brooks has actually said it's Possibilities Ministries. I did notice that. So he's going to share with us how uh, his program will relate to God and his gospel. Thank you for coming to LaGrange. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good morning and happy Sabbath. It's a pleasure being here at the beautiful LaGrange Church. And I can say I've been enjoying myself. I enjoyed the wonderful music just now. Beautiful singing, uh, the stories, uh, the prayer, uh, just everything, even the welcome. Um, the, the, I also enjoyed uh, the Sabbath school. Did you enjoy it? Um, Brother Uche, is he, where, where, where did he go? He's in the back. Okay, and his lovely wife, um, uh, he reminded me and said, hey, you remember, uh, you participated in our wedding. And so it's a pleasure to, to play that role. And I just want to wish you both uh, the very best. Uh, it's good to, to be here with you. I'm joined with my wonderful mother-in-law, Miss Winifred Forrester. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Without her, I would not be happily married to my wife right now. <laughs> and we just celebrated 21 years, um, July 13. And we have four uh, wonderful children. And so maybe another time, I uh, will be able to get them here uh, to fellowship with you. So I'm also the Disabilities Ministries Coordinator slash Possibilities Ministries. So you may hear these two titles going around. I'll just share a little bit uh, with you. North America Division uh, started the Disabilities Ministries, and so it had spread. Um, uh, sometimes for the General Conference, we'd use a special needs ministry. Uh, they recently changed to Possibility Ministries. North America Division is still using Disabilities Ministries because of its um, usage. Um, it's well known, as you know, with the American with Disabilities Act. It's something that is recognized all around. Uh, so, and the focus is a little bit different um, with disabilities and possibilities. But for me, I just say, hey, um, if you want to use disabilities slash possibilities, so long as we are serving God's people. Amen? Uh, so, I encourage each church to select someone for that ministry because disabilities is seeking to minister uh, according to the CDC, to those with vision um, challenges, movement, thinking, remembering, learning, communicating, hearing, mental health, and social relationships. It's varied. Uh, but when you have someone who can help the church to uh, be well-trained and versed uh, in these categories, it means that you can give an invitation to the community to come. We're making room for you. And so this is an opportunity uh, to spread the good news of the gospel. And there are many individuals, believe me when I say there are many individuals right now in their homes who are longing for someone to knock on their doors and say, we're willing to minister and to cater for you. So this is a ministry I would encourage you to really look at. Uh, today I'd like to speak with you on the topic that will maybe shed some light as to how God looks upon those with disabilities. And the topic is Leah, the apple of God's eye. Let's pray. Lord, even now we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies. And even now as we open your word to look at this cherished personality and character in Scripture, Lord, we pray that you will bless us, that you will anoint us, and give us a word that will refresh our hearts in Christ's name. I don't know if um, Pastor Mello will be looking on uh, where he's at in New Zealand, but I do pray that God will bless him as he is ministering uh, in a different uh, area, territory, vineyard, 
but I pray that God will allow his ministry to be fruitful. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 29, Genesis 29. And we had our scripture reading that was eloquently read earlier. I'm thinking by the wife of Ryan. Is that no? Oh, I got it wrong. <laughs> okay, well, we're grateful for, for that. Now, who was Leah? Who was Leah? Leah, the Bible reveals, was the older of two girls born to Laban. Laban was the nephew of Abraham. His father was Nahor, the brother of Abraham. Now, now, since this would be cool, except for one thing, Nahor had refused to continue on the journey with Abraham to the promised land. Nahor was content with his idols and decided to dwell in the land of Ur and then Haran. His son Laban also trusted in idols, and here his daughters would have grown up in this environment. They did, however, learn of their aunt, Rebekah, whom the God of Abraham providentially chose to be the wife of Isaac. They may have dreamed that this would be their lot as well, to come out of a rough situation with their father. You see, Laban wasn't exactly the most likable character. As you will see, he was greedy and money-loving. Even when his sister Rebecca was to marry Isaac in Genesis 24 and verse 30, it wasn't until he saw the wealth of the messengers that he gave his blessings. This love affair with money would blind his heart to things of greater value in his life. And this parallels into disabilities where people see value in you only for what you can return. What a lesson for families today. For the love of a little more money, you think you would be happier, more content, more alive, yet discontent continues to break into your heart and life. It seems we're always working for this elusive thing of, of success and happiness, but, but never content. On the scene comes Jacob, beginning in chapter 29. He did not come to the land because he was in pursuit of a wife. He came because he was escaping his brother's wrath. This man had uh, deceived both his father and his brother and was now on the run. So it wasn't exactly the Hollywood trappings of a love story. The first person that Jacob saw from the family was Rachel. And he saw and he loved her. When, and when he had stayed a month with the family, he was also introduced to Leah and the sons of Laban. And a conversation ensued in Genesis 29 and verse 15. The Bible says, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now, since it was customary for the older daughter to be married first, Laban had given him this generous offer expecting him to say Leah. Jacob knew the custom. He knew he should have said Leah as the older daughter, let me marry her. He had an obligation. But Jacob went by his sight. He had seen Rachel and loved the fact that she was beautiful and well-favored. So from all that he could see, she was the one. When he looked at Leah in comparison to Rachel, she did not sparkle as some versions in the Hebrew says. She didn't pop out at him. Other versions will say she was tender-eyed. Possibly that she had a problem with her eyes, whether in how they appeared or how they functioned. The Bible isn't specific. 
But because this was the primary reason for Jacob's dismissal of her, it leads us to conclude that whatever tender-eyed was to Leah, it became a disability, for in her culture it was a liability, for no one saw her possibilities. This was now a special need to her. When Jacob gave the pronouncement that he would work seven years for the hand of Rachel, it pained Leah's heart. She was rejected from the onset as the first daughter, and she was rejected on account of something she couldn't help. For seven years, she watched Jacob toil and work hard for the hand of Rachel. And during those seven years, no man came and asked for her hand. Please understand what this must have done to the self-esteem of Leah. The father is praying that somebody, anybody, will take her hand. But nobody comes to the scene. You see, first, nobody wanted anything to do with a conniving and crafty man like Laban. And second, she did not have what they wanted. At the end of the seven years, we then see an act of cruelty. Laban commanded both his daughters to do something that neither desired. First, for Rachel to not participate in her own wedding. And second, for Leah to remain quiet in the deception of Jacob. This was parental abuse in the highest form. For both women felt like they had no choice. You see, just because you hold the purse strings over your children does not give the right to disrespect them in any way. Since there are many yous and many me's, let them grow up with dignity and honor in their lives. Poor Leah, now shamelessly used by her father, and now in the morning, instead of being greeted with love and respect from her husband, she's now met with scorn and derision. And she learns amidst it all that Jacob, in a heat as he goes to Laban, he goes and he says to, to Laban that I'm willing to work another seven years for the hand of Rachel. So at the end of the week, the Bible says he was able to also marry Rachel, but he had to serve another seven years. That's verse 28. Leah now found herself in a polygamous relationship with her sister as competitor. Polygamous means that having more than one mate at the same time, or at one time. And this was not what Leah dreamed of. This was not the perfect wedding she planned. This was not the life she hoped for. Saints, uh, by the way, just understand, for some who argue that a polygamous relationship is okay, you will never find one relationship of that sort in the Bible that worked out fine. This was not Jacob's plan. His father Isaac had one wife, and he wanted to continue in that stead. God had created for Adam, not two. And the tenth commandment states, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife not wives. Saints, problems will come your way when you go outside of God's will and counsel. Verse 30 tells us, Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven years. And verse 31 declares, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah had hit rock bottom. She had a special need. She was used by her father, scorned by her husband, loathed by her sister, and mocked by her people. And understand, saints, that God doesn't see things the way we do. God does not value people the way we do. We see a girl with tender eyes. God sees a woman of worth and dignity. We see a woman scorned by her household, while God sees a gem of intricate value. We see a girl mired in fragility. God sees a girl filled with possibilities. 
God, who is busy holding and keeping planets together, looked with special interest upon the treatment poured on his child and felt hurt by it all. He saw her tears. He saw her brokenness. He heard the insults and her, that were hurled at her and watched the cold shoulder of indifference shown to her by her husband Jacob. And God got tired of it all. They were touching the apple off his eye. And he intervened. And by the way, if you, if you touch your pupil, it's the most sensitive part of your eye. And God was saying, listen, you are touching someone who is very close to me. This person, once you hurt her, you're hurting my feelings directly. And God came through and intervened on her behalf. I thank God that he is in the business of intervening. Amen? He is in the business of getting involved when they in the home, in the church, in the community, Jesus will come in and intervene for us when we're at our workplace. He will come and intervene for us in our own families. He will intervene for us even here at church. So the Bible says, when the Lord saw, verse 31, and you're going to hear a lot of expressions when it comes to this word saw, because you see, man sees not as the Lord sees. We look on the outward. God looks on the heart. Jacob missed a lot of things about Leah because he judged her from afar. Jacob missed her beauty, for each person is beautiful in their own rights. You are beautiful with or without makeup. You are beautiful with or without hair. Amen. You are beautiful with or without a disability, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That Jacob missed an opportunity of conveying to Leah the beauty that she possessed was not lost on God. Jacob missed an opportunity of commending her for having put up with the habits of her father Laban. Jacob couldn't wait to get out of the situation with Laban. So can you imagine what life was like for her? It required a lot of patience. Jacob didn't see that she was loyal and obedient to her father. And get this, even when things didn't seem right, she was obedient. How could Jacob not see that? He did the same thing when he listened to his mother and dressed up like Esau, deceiving his own father. He was obedient to his mother as she was to her father. They both had a similar personality. But you see, saints, we scorn the faults in others that unknowingly reminds us of ourselves. Of the 13 children that were born between Jacob's two wives and two handmaids, Leah bore six sons and a daughter, seven children in all. And I believe that seven is a perfect number. When I think about seven, I'm thinking about completeness. The Bible mentions the seven churches, the seven trumpets, the seven angels, the seventh-day Sabbath. You can't add to that number. It's a perfect number. Woe be unto the man who can sit in a hospital room and see his wife go through the pain and agony of bearing a child and just turn his back on her. There ought to be a contract that says if you walk out, you have to experience the same intensity of pain. Amen? Amen. Saints, four times I watched my wife deliver, and I saw the pain that she went through. And saints of God, I can just tell you this. Um, there's no way I want to turn my back on her. This lady went seven times to bear children. For Jacob, seven times. Jacob missed seeing all of that. So God fixed him. Jacob had deceived his father Isaac because his father's vision was failing. If tender eyes could mean vision failing, then that's what Isaac may have had in his older age. And God said, okay, let's see now, Jacob, how do you like it? So it was in the middle of the night, the darkest hour of the night, that Jacob had unveiled his bride. And in that tent, he knew not who he was with. Why? Because he couldn't see 
clearly. How does it feel, Jacob, to be taken advantage by someone when you can't see? It's likely that Christ himself, clothed in the form of a man, wrestled with Jacob in the dark of the night, fooling him into thinking it was a perfect stranger, and how frightening it was in the dark, wrestling with a complete stranger. And God was teaching him a lesson about disabilities. Don't make fun. Don't mock. Don't take advantage of someone with a disability. This may be why God shared in Leviticus 19 and verse 14, Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. God was screaming in that passage, basically saying to us, If you hurt one such soul, you're hurting me. If you abuse one such soul, you have to deal with me. Jacob could not see past Leah's tender eyes to take her as his wife. And so in the garden, in Genesis 32 and verse 25, while he wrestled with God, God touched his hip and it came out of place. It shows that when the sun rose on him, he was now walking with a limp. He was now disabled. The once proud man now becomes humbled and in need of affection. We don't see wherein his family abandons him. And he's certainly not forsaken by Leah because of his impediment. She already knows how it feels to be judged and stigmatized. And so she displays kindness in her interaction with Jacob. Humbled, Jacob can now sympathize, now empathize, not only with Leah, but with everyone else with a disability. But saints, I need to tell you something, that while God was working on Jacob's heart, God was also working on Leah's heart. God was the heart of his church to make room for those with disabilities. And God is also at work to ensure that each person knows just how blessed they really are. You see, God wanted to bring Leah to a place of confidence, knowing who she was in the sight of the Almighty. So in verse 31, the Bible says, uh, Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. God opened her womb, but listen to the names she gave her children and the reasoning. Verse 31, Reuben, because now, look, my husband will love me. Verse 33, um, she bore a son and said, uh, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved. He has the son also, and she called his name Simeon. You can go to verse 34 and verse 35. Uh, she continually was, was doing this, uh, trying to get the love, trying to get the attention of her husband. But in verse 35, the Bible says, She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. You see, something happened at this point in Leah's life. It's as if she paused to meditate on what God was doing in her life. This fourth child was different. Before, she was naming her children and seeking to get love from her husband. Now she just paused from all of that. She's not seeking to get his attention. She is praising God. She's not trying to be loved. It's as if she knows now that she is love. And maybe, just maybe, God revealed to her the beauty of this child. You see, saints, usually by today's standards, you're considered a prince or a princess by virtue of your ancestors. For Leah, while it is true that she's generally a child of God, you and I fall into that bracket. She was much more. For God chose this tender-eyed woman to be the matriarch of the lineage of Jesus. 
It was in Judah's lineage that Caleb, King David, King Solomon would come to the throne. That by itself would be impressive enough, but the most impressive of all is that it is from her that eventually the Son of God would come to the earth. The Son of God, a.k.a. the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, thereby signifying the status of princess to this tender-eyed woman. She's a princess not because of her ancestry, but because of her descendants. If Jacob had known this about Leah, he would not have scorned her. Known that his daughter was this precious and important, he would not have demeaned her. Had Rachel known this of her sister, she would not have been in competition with her. Had the tribesmen known this of her, they would have all proposed to her. Had Leah known this of herself, she would never run after the affections of her husband. She didn't have to chase after no man in order to feel important and respected. God respected. God loved her. And God was blessing her. What if, saints, we could see the significance of each person with a disability at this point and not when we get a clearer view in heaven? Jacob eventually understood the beauty of Leah. For long after Rachel had died, giving birth to Benjamin, Leah would eventually breathe her last. In Genesis 49 and verse 30, we learn that she was buried in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan. And Jacob said to his sons, bury me, bury me where Abraham and Sarah his wife dwells. Bury me where Isaac and Rebekah, his wife, dwells. And listen now, he said, bury me where I buried Leah. This was his dying wish, to be buried next to Leah, the tender-eyed princess whom he now loved. If he could have done it all over again, he would have treated her differently. If he could have done it all over again, he would have boosted her self-esteem. If he could do it all over again, he would have encouraged her possibilities. Now Jesus took this up and honored this woman by making her the matriarch in his tribe. Not only that, but Jesus patterned his ministry after hers. Isaiah says this about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus was rejected because he did not fit the description of what we were looking for in a Messiah. The physical attributes, the social clout Jesus didn't possess. Yet he loved us even in those moments when we turned our backs on him. As Leah loved Jacob even when he scorned her. The Bible says he bore our sorrows and was a man of sorrows. Leah was a woman of sorrows. He was despised and rejected of men. Leah, for seven years, she was rejected by all the men. He was not esteemed. She was not esteemed. And to this day in our preaching, we don't esteem her. Rarely do we have a children's story that makes Leah look like a good person. 
Yet if, it was, yet if it was not for her, our favorite Bible characters would not exist. If it wasn't for her, Jesus would not have had the opportunity, or we would not have had the opportunity of, of, of reading of Jesus coming on this earth. And we wouldn't have the opportunity of meeting our favorite characters in heaven. Jesus was saying to his church, look, I'm not going to come the way you would like me to come. You're going to have to love me for who I am. You're going to have to love me for my character, not my externals. You know, here's the thing, saints. Sometimes we go by sight. I'm just going to come off notes here. But when was the last time you turned on a television and looked at a news program and saw someone with a visible disability reading the news? You see, we don't see that. And in our society, we, we oftentimes highlight those who, in all appearance, are beautiful or handsome. And so oftentimes, those with physical disabilities are, are, are pushed in the background as if they can't read a news broadcast as well. And here's what Jesus says to us as a church. If you can't love those with physical bearings of disability, how can you love a Messiah who for time and eternity will bear physical scars on his hands, feet, side? Now, saints, understand, when we look at many pictures of Christ, they're, they're romanticized. Jesus is looking good and healthy with just maybe a, a little piercing here. But if you can recall uh, the whip that lacerated his back may have also disfigured his face because the whip does not discriminate where it lands. And Jesus said, I'm going to keep the scars on my body. We only highlight this. We're talking about his back was lacerated, and we don't know. He also had the crown of what? On his brow. And he says, I'm keeping those. I'm keeping those scars. So when you get to heaven or when Jesus blows that trumpet and if we're alive and you're caught up or you are dead and you raise, uh, the first person you're going to see is Christ. And you say, hold up. He has so many scars on his body. And in all appearances, just like Leah, a physical disability or something that, that, that um, can be seen externally can also be seen as a disability. So we may say, look, Jesus comes bearing disabilities. But the thing is that though he will heal everyone here, though you're going to be resurrected in newness of life, Jesus, however, chooses to keep this body that has all the scars visible on him. And the question is, if we are not able to love those with disabilities whom we can see, how are you going to love the one with disabilities, whom at this point you cannot see, but one day you will see. How will you meet our Lord and Savior? I want to encourage uh, each person today, as a church family, to make room for those with disabilities. Like Jacob, God has to work on our hearts. Because again, we're, we're born and shaped in a society, an ableist society, where we look out for those uh, who are non-disabled. So we have to say, Lord, help us to look out for those with disabilities. Help us to be patient. Help us to be kind. Help us to make room for each individual. And that requires the hard transformation. God had to wrestle with Jacob to bring him to that place where he understood you can't mock those with disabilities. God had to wrestle with him. And God has to wrestle with us as a church as well. I share this with you in, I believe, 1990, the Disabilities Act was, was passed here in America, the ADA Act. And the voices that opposed the act the, the most came from the church. And the church was saying, it's too expensive to make room for those with disabilities. And so, literally, the government says, it's not going to affect the churches. So because of the outcry from the church, our churches, the churches weren't mandated to really make their 
uh, schools or their buildings accessible. It's really by the kindness of the pastors and leaders that we do that. Some laws in some provinces may really push it upon churches, but um, it's simply by the kindness. The church should have been the leading voice to say, we will spend the money. We're going to make room for those of this because we love them. The church has to be that leading voice. But today, we can still be that voice that says we are making room for those with disabilities. And if you have a disability, whatever the disability may be, understand that you are loved by God. You are the apple of God's eyes. If someone hurts you, if someone mocks you, God says, I hear, I remember, I will deal with that. But I want you to know you are loved and you are precious to me. Understand your worth in Jesus Christ. If it is this church's uh, willingness to, to allow God to use us to minister to those with disabilities, to have a transformed heart in the power and through the power of Jesus, I invite you, just raise your hand wherever you may be. Let us pray. Lord, even now, we thank you for the ability to come before your presence to pray to you. Lord, I'm asking that you will bring transformation to the members here at LaGrange. Lord, these are wonderful, dedicated uh, souls that are sharing the gospel, that are fellowshipping together, that are ministering in this community. And we're praying, oh God, that your Holy Spirit will take full control of each person, each life, each family represented here. Lord, I pray that you will help us all to to be the, the church that shows love, the love of Christ to the community and to those who come in fellowship. We're growing in this area, Lord, in a world of disabilities. In times past, we, we neglected those with disabilities. But Lord, it's a new age, it's a new day, and we pray, God, that we will make room for each person with a disability because there are wonderful possibilities in each person and each family. So bless us to that end, and I pray, Jesus, that you'll bring transformation to our hearts as you did to the heart of Jacob. Lord, you may have to touch us. You may have to humble us. You may have to allow us to, to come to a place where we realize that it's wrong to call others by names. It's wrong to mock those with disabilities. It's wrong, Lord, to, to, to do activities without thinking about others with disabilities. So, Lord, please grant us the, the understanding, the sympathy, the empathy to make room. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. Bless this church in a mighty way, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.